This presentation was recorded at the 12th International Conference on Rapid Response Systems and Medical Emergency Teams. Thank you very much and thanks for um, the coming to the last session. Uh, to add what, to what Rob has uh, been uh, previously talking about being a director, um, this is an excursion. Um, I started with MERT, wasn't called that then, in about 1994, work out my age. And uh, when I came on board at Royal Brisbane Hospital. And so this is a story of some of the things which have come up, which continue to come up, which perhaps are irksome. We went from a very old hospital that I still enjoyed working in to this very new hospital. And this was the impetus for developing a MERT back in about uh, 2005 when the move occurred. And um, Ken Hillman wouldn't let us into his trial. We were young intensivists and we were keen to take part, but when we were looked at, he said, you've already got a MERT. Because we needed to have an extended cardiac arrest team because the ICU was in the old hospital and you saw how far away the new hospital was on that building. We had to run between the two buildings, uh, which uh, used to take 15 minutes and they wouldn't buy me a golf cart to attend the MERT. So I stopped going because I was too bloody distinct, if the truth be known. And then through all of this sort of problem, we had the difficulty of proving the value of medical emergency responses, and luckily we've gradually accumulated data. But um, as Rob was uh, alluding to, these are very highly complex systems. It's not a MERT team on its own. Uh, many of the, the hospitals have grown by topsy to get to where they are. And uh, a lot of people still don't believe in MERTs because they are primary clinicians and they know how to look after their patients without any help from anybody. We still struggle with both low and high MERT rates and don't know what to do about it. And the clear benefit of a MERT uh, that John Santa Maria pointed out may take several years. And in fact, Rob showed that with cardiac arrests. Um, many hospitals have moved to some form of a system, so it's making it very, very difficult to assess now what the true value of a MERT is in an organisation. So this is one of the problems. I could get data back to 2007, largely off my computer, and we sort of have this MERT rate, and you can see that we were having a, a large number of patients MERTing over a period of time. And initially the ICU just collected what it could, basically on a laptop and, and paper. And then we moved to a process of some corporate interest when it was clearly becoming a nightmare. And finally, we have a proper centralised computerised system, which sadly, though, is still based upon a paper record and is very time consuming, although there is this attempt to keep it up to date. If you don't think our MERT weight was increasing because the size of the hospital increased, well, that's not true. So for 1,000 bed days, we were in a lot of trouble with 200 calls per 1,000 um, bed days in hospital and we were not coping very well. And my colleagues were pretty much getting the shits with all of this. So here, the change to a medical uh, emergency response team, we thought we were doing really well. And as Ronaldo said, when we were all struggling with this, the genie well and truly got out of the bottle. But we have done some things to shove Barbara Eden back where she belongs in the last couple of years. And probably about three of you know who Barbara Eden is. We've had an, a changing, as the literature suggests, um, um, team. So the Merck was basically us with the MedReg. And why the MedReg is still in charge, I've got no idea, but that's what internal medicine want. Um, the cardiac arrest team was from the emergency department and then that just became ridiculous when they were doing no work and we were doing all the work, so eventually it just became ICU. But where we put our foot down was in the area of dealing with going up to the carpenter's quarters and the RMO bar. We didn't quite think that was an ICU responsibility. So. Um, the Dems still go there and they don't like going out there either and they reckon they're not trained. So in this period of escalation where we're getting more calls, you can see that we went from a, a pure code blue cardiac arrest system, but in fact it was called for everything else, um, to changing of criteria over time 
with tweaking to try and make the system more sensitive. So we were well ahead of the game before national criteria were published. We were, uh, and that makes it very difficult to change. If you've educated a hospital over a long period of time with the best you could do from the literature and then the national standard gets imposed upon you, it costs you a truckload of money to change. And we haven't. And then a whole lot of things happened of creating a, a change that there was an urgent clinical review criteria, which is basically a two-tiered system. You know, get your ass up here, registrar. Still remained with the MERT, and then had a process of hospital at night, and <laughs> bang, they come down. So the things hanging off the system are probably important as well than just the system itself with nothing to help it out. I agree with Rob, and I... Uh, I disagree with some. You have to have a team all the time. Uh, although there, we find the dead at change of shifts, and it, most nurses know that, but in fact it's a very flat call rate throughout the day in our hospital. So it's, it's not true in our hospital that it gets quiet at night. It doesn't. This is a bit of a concern. Aren't we fantastic? Maybe not. And I don't know what that means. Um, but, um, and, and in fact, this is very raw type data and, and this is not the way to look at the data. We probably should be doing a moving average, but in fact, that's all we can spit out of our system simplistically at two o'clock in the morning. Like everybody else, we have lots of different core criteria over time. That's why there's seven of them. But in fact, uh, most of them um, have multiple criteria like the literature suggests. We have our own set of MERT criteria, MERT syndromes, if you like, a little bit different to other people, a little bit similar to other people, but nothing. But interestingly, we get called for, I don't know why that happens. I haven't seen that on any list, but it occurs. Most of them, like everybody else, are left in the ward on their own, and then they get transferred to other areas. Uh, very few of our MERTs are actually cancelled. And then we have the, the conundrum of the acute resuscitation plan, and we get really cranky about people not doing them. Well, they're a bloody new phenomenon. And like everything else, it takes a while to get traction. And we are slowly, maybe not, getting traction. So um, we find that uh, in a very small number of patients, the MERT creates the first ARP, and then that's changed in a significant number if it is existing. ICU has its own problems, that if uh, about 6% in our organisation go to the ICU, well, 6% of them have been recently discharged as well. So if we could stop going to seeing the ones that we already discharged, we'd save ourselves a lot of work. So we're not totally uh, blameless. Now, this is a phenomenon that some people don't have. We have had up to nine simultaneous calls within five minutes. That is impossible to deal with. But a significant number are occurring before the time the team has returned. So you at least have to have a second team and a third team. And we have a quite a complicated call system of dealing with the need for secondary, tertiary, quaternary call. We've managed to stretch to six, but you can imagine what the ICU was like, creating six independent teams to go and resuscitate on the ward. And the nine occurred at 10 o'clock at night in a, a torrential storm when no staff came into work. Ah, uh, neurosurgery. <laughs> but, to be fair, neurosurgery said enough is enough. And in the same period that everything else was coming down, they created a high dependency unit of their own. What's the effect of that? I've got no idea because there was too much other stuff going on at the time. And this is what happens. The, the system changes. And that's a slide I showed earlier um, yesterday to suggest that hospitals change over time and increasingly high dependency units, which didn't exist in my organisation, are now creeping back in. Then we, of course, have the handoffs, the nightly handoffs. So they all go to the doctor's coffee room and hand off ICU variably involved in this. It, would be nice if it was a bit better. And this is occurring in the same period of time. So all the important people go up there, no consultants involved, I hasten to add, 
And again, over this same 2004 time period, we thought that this was fantastic. But, of course, neurosurgery opened its high dependency unit and that might totally explain it and our handoffs are actually accomplishing nothing of consequence. So it's very difficult to sort this out, even though everybody was happy with the process and there were some surrogate markers of improved documentation and people did feel that they knew what was going on. Now to move on uh, from what Rob said about uh, observation forms, yes we started with our version of the state form because we were in there first and of course that didn't meet the needs of neurosurgery because you can't pick a hemiplegia and that was a significant problem. So changes had to be made to, and, and quite rightly to fit groups because if it's not on the form they don't look at it. That's the problem. So cancer care had its own form related largely to sedation. Cardiology needed to look at the leg after they'd done catheters because we lost a few because the nurses didn't notice they were black. So that had to become a routine of. Mental health has its own observations for going mad, um, largely, largely with the sedation score for them, to be fair. And then I already mentioned the problems of the outbuildings, and that's been highlighted at the special groups, of that these are places that nobody is being to. The best I did was in the physiotherapy hydrotherapy pool, and the patient was in the middle, and there was no lifeguard. Work out how to do that with your Merck trolley. It was hilarious. Anyway, that's a story from when we had a few beers. The other things we found was the wheels fell off the trolley and badly imaged one of our nursing staff that took about six months off to recover from a badly damaged leg. So these sort of things do come up and require a great deal of attention. We found that there was very little standardisation of kit back in 2005 and in fact with defibrillators all around the world they were different models, different types and very few of them actually reached full charge because they hadn't actually been test in, tested in more than a decade. Um, so we tend to bring our own kit rather than relying on other people's kit. We waste a lot of drugs by opening packs so we don't have amiodarone anymore, we don't have calcium anymore, we don't have bicarbonate anymore because if the kit is opened it all gets tossed. So we save a lot of money by ICU bringing a little bit and the wards have got bare essentials and that seems to work well. Increasingly as you know people do can't remember the drug dosages and all of that type of stuff so increasingly the trolleys have got reminders of all of that on it prominently displayed. But I reckon our biggest problems come in training and lack of support for training. So in 1994 when I started there was nothing. And so we introduced a modular program of bedside skills which included a form of ACLS at that time and that was in the days of cardiac arrest and that was pretty good. And then that was supported up until 2000. We decided that that had to be beefed up a little bit and so ACLS became more mandatory. The best we could squeeze out of the organisation for no money was a half day program. But because we had a good intern program, it wasn't too bad and you were updating skills as opposing to learning them new. And we gave them resources around the core criteria as well as some selected ill core readings. Um, so we get up to a little bit later, and this would really be around about 2010, building on the intern program, but the trouble is that despite only having five chapters of ill core to read, they whinged and they didn't read it. Um, we had limited assessment of competency and they were always being called back to the ward and in those days they were just simple ACLS scenarios, not true MERT scenarios. So we then went on, at 2010 sorry, to create a more formal program that everybody seemed to like and it was a one day program. Um, we had the issues of moving to this because a lot of the intern stuff had been taken over by a statewide um, uh, training program. So we concentrated back in 2010 and things that we were commonly seeing and again largely based upon some ill core readings and some other additional readings which were common. And we had a program that's not particularly important but to be able to say we screwed a whole day out of the organisation rather than half a day and we largely concentrated on medical registrars. 
We put um, we then put the program online, and you'll see that in a minute. And although we had a lot of people enrolling and gave them two years to do the program, only half of them accessed it. And although we thought that we were probably about 20 hours of work in this, and they were told that, they didn't really look at it. Um, and there were huge problems with attendances, although they did, still seemed to pass the exam. And this is the type of stuff that was online with questions. These were moving uh, pictures. So a lot of work went into this and a $100,000 grant, in fact. But the point is that they didn't attend. There was very little support from their parent units. And despite a lot of effort being put into the quality, the kids don't read it. So in the last couple of years, it's reverted back to internal medicine teaching this with a little bit of help from ICU um, and in fact the timing has been brought back to half a day and the attendance is much better because it's actually being run by the department of the team leader as opposed to being an ICU department that they don't have to uh, pay for okay and we're having the same sort of developments as others so the things that I take out of that very sadly, despite giving them a big comprehensive course that was well received when they did it, but they wouldn't come, um, is shorter seems to be better. The organisation has to be supplying the teaching, not just us, otherwise there's excuses for them not to turn up. They don't seem to want to be assessed. They don't want to do an exam. That's very sad because they always got what they went wrong back. They do have limited practical knowledge and, and, and really the group that is doing them, are, including the medical teams, have to bear some responsibility. Increasingly, we've had a huge governance. There are so many people around the table at the governance meeting, there is no oxygen. And, and for this reason, the actual work of the group has had to be shunted to uh, working groups, in fact, because this is now a very top-heavy um, reporting group. So in summary, what I can say is the national guidelines are clearly important and have been helpful to settle some arguments. In developing any program over a very long period of time, there are lots of problems that are common and there's lots of solutions to them, the problems. But where people are is because our organisations have had to run ahead of national guidelines, and many organisations have. And the approaches have to be targeted for the institution you're in, as well as the culture of the institution. And certainly my organisation is improving in its culture for rapid response. Very important that it's somebody's job, otherwise nobody does it. So having somebody responsible for the training program and the provision of the MERT is important, as well as you can see that the data is difficult in my place because of the programs of collecting it uh, without having a MERT study to kick you into uh, gear uh, are problematic and difficult to get funding for. Thank you.